Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, let the people vote. Also, the V Team takes a look at more ethics complaints. And Speaker Mike Hubbard's going to trial. See me. Feel me. Touch me. Uh, hey guys, it's Hubbard, not Bentley. Aww. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. The Voice of Alabama Politics, with your host, Bill Brett. Now, the number one political show in Alabama, The V. Welcome to The Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and as always, I'm joined by the V Team. Welcome all. Good, Good morning. morning, all. <laughs> it once again has been another crazy week in Alabama politics, but we have a day of reckoning for Mike Hubbard. Finally. People said he would never be indicted. He was on 23 felony counts of public corruption. They said he would no, never go to trial, and he's headed that way, Susan. He is. Uh, we're looking at taking opening statements, I believe, on Tuesday this coming week. Uh, as exciting as that is, I, I, I never thought we'd really get here. Uh, there were so many people that kept saying, no, he won't be indicted. No, he'll never go to trial. No. But we're here. We're finally here, and we're going to get to hear this. Jack, there's still speculation out there that Mike's going to cop a plea deal at the 11th hour. I understand that every time he actually hears that, he goes ballistic. Yeah. Because yeah, he has that. no... I think to the point that they started sending tentacles to figure out who started He's that rumor. He's too arrogant to plea. Yeah, I think so. You know, I he, believe so. He, you know, I, I'm just glad we're fine. You know, it's really what you just said about we're excited. It's really kind of sad to feel that way. But this has been going on for so long, and, you know, we've been on the inside of it, and I, I'm with you. I'm ready for it to get going. I mean, Beth, it, 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 it looks like we're going to have a trial. So far, so good. Yeah. I mean, we've got a jury, and we've got – the pieces are in place, and I mean, unless something happens in the eleventh hour, which you know isn't unforeseeable at this point, it looks like we're going to trial on Tuesday. I got a call this week from a powerful, uh, a wealthy GOP donor, who said that he received calls from Rob Riley this past week trying mm -hmm. to raise money for Hubbard. I mean, Susan, help me out with that. Well, that's a bit of a mystery. I mean, are they trying to raise money for an appeal? Certainly they're not calling and saying, can you help Mike out with the fines that he's going to be facing at the end of this trial? I'm not sure exactly where their mindset is in this, but they still are trying. And he's not, that donor is not the only one uh, that's being solicited. There are other people out there also soliciting on Mike Hubbard's behalf. Well, we remember what Richard Scrushy did with a lot of money that he raised during his civil trial and... I wouldn't put it past this crew on anything. Well, that mm -hmm. takes us to jury selection. You know, they, there was some strategy revealed during ju jury selection because Bill Baxley and his team for the defense brought up the names like Baron Coleman, uh, Gene Sisson, uh, Kevin Turner, Claire Haynes. I mean, Beth, these are all people that testified to what? This is all prosecutorial misconduct. And the judge, I thought, had said that we've ruled on this. And it seems like they keep trying to bring up this ship that has sailed. And, you know, I just hope that the jury doesn't buy it. I hope the jury sticks to the facts on this. Jack? They don't have anything else. Yeah. That's the only way they're going to get him off is to say that the attorney general's office talked out of school and shared secret information, which the judge ruled earlier there was no evidence of that. This is the only way they can beat this rap because... Mm -hmm. You know, y'all, we've seen it. All of us know what went on. And this jury is fully aware of what they're getting into. The first day of jury selection, uh, Judge Walker read, it took 20 minutes and read the full indictments to the jury before they ever really started preparing or selecting the jury out of this. Well, one of the things that shocks me and why Judge Walker didn't rule on this in the motions in limine beforehand is during the Barry Moore case, Beth, as we well know, he told them they could not bring up prosecutorial misconduct or uh, vindictive prosecution. I mean, they're going to try to make the 
Matt Hart, Van Davis, and all those guys look like the criminals. And and mm -hmm. and here here sits poor Mike. He's just poor picked Bless on his heart. Mike. Just a, he's just a businessman who happened to be a little pushy and happens to be a politician at the same time. Bless his heart. You know, I don't know. I, I, I'm concerned generally because of the fact that anti-government sentiment is so high right now in the country on all sides. There's so much distrust and so much polarization that I'm afraid that it's going to be a delicate balance to keep the jury from from not polarizing along with the sides in this case. I mean, it'll be interesting. Well, it is an interesting makeup of the jury. Uh, we have uh, nine African Americans, mm -hmm. seven Caucasians sitting on the jury. Jack, that has given you a little pause, hasn't well, it? Well, you know, because the, the composition of Lee County is not weighted like that. Yeah, Lee County is only 23% African American. Well, I mean, Mike Hubbard has like the whitest district in Alabama and the smallest in geographical, you know, boundaries. Mm -hmm. But you draw the jury pool from the entire county. But what, what did you say is the percentage of? 23%. 23%. Countywide. So. You know, it d does give me a little concern. Well, you know, what, what concerns me more, though, is the nine men to seven women. Because, you know, any time you're looking at a jury, a jury is going to relate more to, an to a defendant who looks like themselves. So, you know, in any case, you're going to have a jury that, you know, I can relate to Susan better mm -hmm. than I can relate to the two of you. And so when you've got well, that nine hurts. men, well, I mean, it's just it's it's the, truth. the truth. And so when you've got nine men on this jury who are working hard and providing for their families, and I'm sure a lot of the women are too, but you're selling him as this businessman who's just trying to, to make a little cash to keep his family afloat. I'm afraid that message will sink in with these men and maybe the women won't put up with it. I'm hoping they won't, but it's Well, you concerning. know, the interesting thing is, is they're going to find out, Susan, that he was making forty to sixty thousand dollars a month. That's not, not sit, a year. It's That's, not going to sit well with a rural ju jury. The annual in median County. income for Lee County is like forty three thousand dollars a year. This is not going to sit year. well. And we're we're talking about rural people here. We're not talking about a lot of people think this is going to be professors from Auburn. Mm -hmm. Yes, that may be a mix of it, but we're talking no. about a lot of rural folks here. That, have, that don't make that a year. I mean, that, that don't make $40,000 a year, as she said. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. But, I, you know, I got to think that, you know, usually in these jury selections, you know, you get a little bit of you don't like them and you get a little bit of you have to like them. But I'm just, I have to remain positive that when all the evidence is presented, that justice will be served. Now, mm -hmm. I have to think Mike Hubbard's a crook. But the jury will decide whether he's a crook. Now, right. we could poll this group. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be a little biased. Here's, here's the thing, and as Beth brought up, also there's the one thing that's easily pointed out. You know, somebody who's built their own business and can understand why he's making money does not have the ability to put 23 words in a Medicaid budget to, be, to benefit mm -hmm. their client. Right. I think that will be very, very clear to this jury. And, you know, Jack, we, you're going to have the lobbyists say he did it. You're going to have Steve Klaus say he did it. You're going to have a lot of people say, yeah, he did it. Greg Wren. Greg Wren. And you know, I think a lot yeah. of this, too, is going to come down to the jury instructions when all of the evidence is presented and they mm -hmm. charge the jury. Because on a lot of these counts, there's going to be some subjective qualities. You know, did he lobby in his official capacity or not? You know, that's, that's a jury question. But some of these things, I mean, did you accept a thing of value from a lobbyist or a principal? Yes or no. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room. The idea that he is going to play the victim just angers me because... We are the victims <coughs> the state of, his, of, of, his, of his misconduct. All right, Absolutely. we're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. He's in the jailhouse now. He's in the jailhouse now. In 1977, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the US Open twice, one in 1.2 billion. The odds of him having a child diagnosed with autism, 
one in 88. Ernie Els encourages you to learn the signs of autism. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. There is going to be a day after this trial. They think the trial is going to last for a month. But the day after is either a chance for change in this state or a chance to move out of the state for many of us. If Mike Hubbard is convicted, we will have a brief window to clean up some institutions, some policies, and, and the way we do business in the state. If he is not convicted, there will be scorched earth like we have never seen before. He will be a monster. But if he is convicted, Beth, I believe that we need to go about looking at the Ethics Commission and other things we can do modestly to clean up our state. What do you think? Right. I mean, when the Republicans took office in 2010, they said, we're going to use this opportunity we call a special session and pass these sweeping ethics laws like nobody has ever seen before. Okay, well, now we've got these sweeping ethics laws. Let's put them to work. I mean, one of the things that you suggested and that we've talked about on this show is let's get rid of the Ethics Commission. It's a waste of money, and it's clearly not doing its job. So let's put it under the AG's office. Let's find a way to say, okay, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? How do we keep the state protected from this type of behavior. I mean, Susan, the Ethics Commission is basically there to, to rubber stamp their misbehavior. We have laws on the books that are specific as to what is an ethics violation. We don't need a commission to tell us what that means. Or basically what they're doing is telling people how to get around those laws. Put it back in the AG's office. That, they know what law is. There are lawyers there that can interpret the law. And they can determine if, just like if you've stolen something, there's laws on the books for that. The, the, the AG's office is just as capable of judging what the ethics laws are as any commission. I mean, Jack, you've got some thoughts on, on how we, we change the system after Hubbard goes? Yeah, abolish the ethics commission, uh, fire the staff, um, and move all the uh, operations over to the white collar unit of the yeah. attorney general's office because, I mean, you, you're right, Susan, it, it's a total rubber stamp. Of bad behavior. I mean, you got to look at who's on the commission. I mean, this guy They're that's all, all Britain is, is like I mean, a Hubbard, Hubbardite. I mean, he's like a family well, friend. He practiced in the firm with Mike Hubbard's sister-in-law, yeah. did he yes, not? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, you he know, did. I mean, and all these people that are appointed is a political plum, you know. Right. Well, I'm on the ethics commission. It's a resume builder. Those people know nothing over there. I mean, it's it's a joke. They've given people license to steal as lobbyists. I mean, we've got two lawmakers that are working for lobbying firms, and the Ethics Commission went, well, that's all right. I mean, you know, yeah, hey. Just make sure yeah. you keep it separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah keep it well, separate, whatever. And, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about, too, is not only the fallout, you know, in the legislative process from this, but all of those people who have been on Mike Hubbard's cheerleading squad this yeah. whole time, and some people who... Honestly, I've been blindsided by. I mean, I was reading the news the other day and had to back up and reread the paragraph because it said Pevlin Warren, a Democratic representative from Macon County, was sitting next to Susan Hubbard in jury selection. What the heck she doing taking there? Taking notes. Taking notes and presumably assisting the speaker with his defense. And, you know, we've got, what, 30-something Democrats in the House. We have no ability to stop any legislation, and we will never have a voice as long as the Democrats can't stick together. You were elected to vote for your district and to work for the people who represent you, not to kiss the speakers behind. And we have got to have enough of this in the Democratic caucus. It's, it's too much. Let's I underline, can't. she's a representative from Macon County who is sitting in she a Lee part, County no, She courthouse. has part of Lee County. Okay. So she does? She does. And so potentially any constituents who would be coming from her district, she's now a familiar face, and she's essentially endorsing the speaker, saying, I'm standing here by his side it's an during this proceeding. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous, and she should have more pride than that, than to be, I don't know what they've given her to do it, but it's ridiculous. Well, usually Mike doesn't give you anything if you're a Democrat. You just, he just takes from you. But uh, we want to move on here. Uh, Susan, you made an incredible discovery this week. You know, people have been referring to this AceGov site, this 501c4 dark money group. Uh, as the girlfriend fund, because there are people who believe it was set up primarily to pay 
the, the governor's girlfriend, Rebecca Caldwell Mason. You found something that might point to the fact that it is a girlfriend fund. It's amazing what you can find when you're looking how to file a FOIA request on somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just break it down real simple. Uh, when they set up ace.gov, as it's called, they didn't complete everything they should have. So when you try to go to ace.gov, if you look up in the address bar, you'll see Rebecca Mason at, I believe it's uh, squarespace.com. Mm -hmm. so so they did, her name so is in the address. Her name is in the address, address. Jack. They didn't bother to go back and change the DNS so it would actually reroute to AceGov. So, so AceGov is essentially RebeccaMason.com. It, it is. It's mm -hmm. never been changed. I mean, Jack. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not computer savvy like you folks, but it's it, they, they they're hiding it from us. They're yeah. they, they're the hiding whole, it. It's a fun for that trollop to get money from the state <laughs> or where or from private funds. People like the University of Alabama paying exactly. into that's ludicrous. They hit, they've hidden it to the point that they didn't bother to write, register ace.gov. What they did register was acegov.com. You can get a .com with just a credit card. It's like and 12 a, and a, bucks. Yeah, yeah, 12 bucks and, and, and a name that's available. But it go, uh, to actually get a .gov, you have to go through procedure. And, and according to your reporting, this is not only the way... Fishers, people who fish mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. used to steal people's information and mm -hmm. make them think they're dealing with the government. You know, it's so funny when when Bentley was running for office and, and our firm was helping him those first nine months, did a bus tour where he announced his candidacy all over Alabama, and we we had and he, he he kept telling me, I want I want transparency, I want the sun to shine on this administration, and he at one of our stops he said, we're going to turn the light on because that way the roaches all run to the to the darkness, and I thought, well, hey, you know what? The roaches are running the show right now. <laughs> you know, it's the other way around. I, well, and, and you know, if he really felt that way, why did he have his whole staff sign confidentiality agreements? Oh, if you're not doing thing. anything wrong, <laughs> what is there for, to hide? What is there to say? And Don't tell anybody. And throw it under the bus. Oh, on that. and to say that, especially when it comes to the Open Records Act, they're not to say anything to the public. I mean, come on, Seth Hammett no more came up with that, that idea than I did. That was Robert Bentley making Seth do his, his dirty, dirty work. work. And it's yeah. just and this, 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 been around long enough that this, he this was in August, right around the time that Miss Bentley filed for a divorce. Does anybody smell paranoia? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. there's Jennifer Artis is leaving the press. Uh, she, she, she has been a bulldog credit, for him. To her credit, and she deserves to she get out of there. She had the toughest job in the state. Well, I tell you. Uh, I talked to several people now. that are former Bentley staffers who said that not only Jennifer Artis' name has come up from the FBI, but also several other people. Now, that doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. It just means that they're being looked at. If I was somebody on Bentley staff right now, I'd be looking for a new job. Oh, yes. But we're going to have to leave it right there. Mm -hmm. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back with more news and analysis. They did a bad, bad thing. 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 are calling. We've elevated barbecue to an art form, a meat masterpiece. Fine dining your thing? National awards are putting us on the map. Because everything's fresh and local. And if you like your dinner with a view, well, you can't beat this. Alabama has a road trip with your name on it. Which one you gonna take? Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. This past week, Johnny McMorrow, Democrat from Red Bay, filed yet more ethics complaints against Rebecca Caldwell Mason and now her husband, John Mason. Susan, catch us up on that. 
Initially, Johnny Mac had, had filed a complaint uh, with the Ethics Commission regarding the fact that uh, Rebecca Mason had actively lobbied the governor to stop a local bill that he was trying to get passed. But now he's going back and looked at that both the ethics uh, filings for John Mason and for Rebecca Mason. Their statement of economic interests. Their interest. statement of economic interests. And he's done it on a line-by-line -line itemization in that what they reported initially and what they've amended their returns for and the differences in between those. And I'm telling you, there are dramatic differences in there. I mean, they swear an oath that these are, sign an oath that these True. are factual, right, right. Beth? And, you know, and this, these errors aren't little things. I mean, I've helped people fill out these forms. I've never had to disclose it, but... You know, there's things where it's like, you know, list any companies you owe more than $10,000 in debt to. And it's not like your credit card bill is at $10,005 this month and you didn't realize it. It's not, this is, you've missed a quarter of a million dollars here. And, you know, it must be nice to be able to just forget that that money's coming in One like that. One of the ones that I keep coming back to that's very simple for, for people to understand. And I believe it was John Mason's 2013 return. He did, when, when it came to saying, who is your spouse? He said N-A. <laughs> not forgot. applicable. Well, apparently also, not. <laughs> it's the truth we're not. Also for his parents and his in-laws. I mean, that's real simple. I think it's mm -hmm. rent a spouse. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hooker spouse. Something like that. And, but they also did all kinds of stuff about their money. I mean, they didn't report all the money and all the people they were working for right. and all this stuff. All that they were really reporting was that John Mason, when he wanted to, admitted he had a company. And then at some point, Rebecca Mason had a company. Uh, and in places, they didn't even say that How her company... How does he have a company when he's got a state job? He doesn't only have a company with a state job. He has a company that's... that's uh, uh, this, he, doing business with the University of Alabama. Company, but he's on the state payroll. That is, he's making almost $100,000 a year at his day job. Well, that's silence money. I mean, you can, only, yeah, you can only work 40, you know, you can work 40 hours a week from 8 to 5 in one job or the other. You exactly. can't be in two places at once. And so you're either not doing your state job to the fullness of your ability or you're getting paid over here for work you're not doing one way or the other. I mean, the which guy is yet another a ethics complaint. Dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. that's pretty if, good. If he's doing that, that's yet another ethics complaint that's coming. Well, what in the University of Alabama paying him all that money? What for? And there's no contract there, right? Because no should have gone through, should have gone through contract money. review. I, I'm just telling you some, is some. You know what Bad these, stuff what these two remind me of are grifters. Uh huh. They, they've mm -hmm. done a long con on Governor Bentley. <laughs> convinced him that they were, oh, she's in love with him, he's in love with her. John is, what did he say? He he got comfortable with the idea of his yeah, wife he did. sexting with the governor? But I'm telling you, if you look at these ethics forms, it is very obvious that that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to hide all of this for years. We're not just talking last year. We're talking about since 2010. Uh, you know, some people, Jack, have wondered, how did these people learn to con the government so quickly. I mean, if that's what they did. Oh, uh, they read that book by Mike Hubbard called. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to copy that uh, on my desk. Or, I need to get back to somebody. Case, keeping the voters abreast of what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a joke. It's a joke. It it is is a mean, joke. But how much money would it take for you to be comfortable with the idea of Susan having those kind of exchanges there with another is person? Not that kind of money around. What it would <laughs> incite me to do is go break somebody's I'm face. I'm kind of looking at those earrings <laughs> right now. Can you just take? Just that one season. Oh, oh yeah. No, that's sick. I'll do, I'll do my Carol Burnett. Sick, 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 sick. You know, there, as they all say, there's not, there's, there's, there's nothing, nothing worse than an old fool. You know. Agreed. I, I still think the University of Alabama, and I'm going to say it's my alma mater. But there's some crooked stuff going on there. Well, I'm just glad you are getting some of the fallouts. We've got Hubbard over in Auburn, yeah. so I'm glad to push well, some of it over to y'all. Well, if I were I would be, I would be nervous as a cat. On a, a porch full of rockers. You just know that I'm not through with ace.gov yet either. Yeah, right. Well, we're, we're going to get there. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who've got a lot of problems. This week or last week, uh, Commissioner McMillan, Ag and Agriculture, Agriculture and Industry Commissioner John McMillan, spoke to a Republican group, and he basically said the day of reckoning is coming. These lawmakers are borrow and spend conservatives. They are have raised taxes. They put us deeply in debt, Jack. And he said it's got to stop, and there has to be leadership to stop it. And you know, and Bentley uh, basically lied during the election in 2014. No new taxes. Then the day after he's elected, JK. he's talking about we got to raise taxes. These guys have known this problem has existed since before they got in office in 2010. And let's not forget the gas tax this last session they tried.
Yeah, I mean, they have done nothing. Well, I'm just glad. I'm glad to see that some Republicans like John McMillan are coming out and saying, look, we really need to start being realistic about Medicaid. It's Obama's term in office is almost over, so we can't say we're not expanding Medicaid to fight Obama anymore. You know, we get 70% of our Medicaid dollars come from the federal government. So, you know, it's just like if you have an employer that matches your retirement contributions, you would be stupid not to max out what they're willing to do. This is like a three times match. It's three free dollars for every dollar we put well, in. John exactly. McMillan is a true uh, uh, man of the people. He's also a true public servant. He is not like these other folks. Now, I will say that if uh, uh, if Trump is elected, we will have we'll love our health plan. It, it will be, be beautiful. Huge. <laughs> It'll be you. Oh, you naysayer. <laughs> Jack, you use the best words. I mean, they're terrific. They really are the best words. And your tax returns, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. I'm on the Trump train, but I'm a reluctant passenger at this point. Okay. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. They'll be coming around the mountain when, when she, she comes. comes. That's right. <laughs> right. All right. I want to get to one last thing here. You know, there's talk of a special session. We hit on this a little bit beforehand in the last show. But I tell you, this lottery and gaming bill that's sitting out there, maybe Marsh is not perfect, but maybe we need to look at letting the people vote. Beth, what could be more democratic? What could be more American right. than letting people vote? We, we don't have a, a citizen's referendum ability in Alabama, so we can't. I can't go around and gather enough signatures to get something on the ballot. The only way to get something voted on is through the legislature. And I know all of our viewers have been waiting you know, with bated breath since I said last week I spent $20 on the lottery in Tennessee. Um, I am still collecting contributions for law school. I did not win the lottery, so I have now contributed to Tennessee's <laughs> education system, and I would love to do the same for Alabama's. So. You know, the lottery seems to be a good solution to a lot of the things that we have here, and I think the people just really want a chance to vote on it. But I think, Jack, you know, they need to be able to vote on this issue and get it off the table. I mean, why are, I mean, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, I, I'm for a lottery. You know, I, I wouldn't play it that often, but... Like, I'm, I'm for casino gambling. I wouldn't go, but it's not because I'm morally opposed. I think it'd be a boon for our economy. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I tell you what, to, for Republicans to say it's not very Republican, they forget that Sheldon Adelson, the guy, one of the biggest casino owners in the world, is a Republican backer, huge Republican backer. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Jack? Well, let's roll the dice on I think when they, when they say it's not very Republican, what they mean is it's not very pious of them to gamble. And there's a, a little bit of a different thing between fiscally conservative and, you know, conservatively religious. Well, you know what? There's nothing more conservative than letting the people have a voice. And there's nothing more conservative than paying your bills. Well, they come down here, they budget. talk about moral issues. They come down here and run around with women and drink whiskey. <laughs> I don't know, you know. May as well throw in the truck back. Let's get some gambling going. Okay, we're going to have to leave it right here. there. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. This past week, we lost a dear friend and colleague, journalist Bob Johnson. He will be missed. You watch us because we watch them.